Welcome to Making a Murderer, Rubber Ducky YouTube channel. Welcome back, you guys, to a new week, and we've got the Artie Making a Murderer Daily Ma'am reading. We're going to read pages 101 to 111, part 11. Page 101, type of activity, assist a missing person case, date of activity, Sunday 11.06.05. Start of service at 0630 hours, end of service at 2030 hours. Reporting Officer, Deputy Dan Kercharski. On 11.06.05, I, Dan Kercharski, responded to the scene at State Highway 147 and Avery Road. Upon arrival at the scene, I was given the assignment to search a garage at 12.932 Avery Road by Lieutenant Bowie. I went to the residence to conduct the search with Lieutenant James Link, Badge 204, Detective Dave Remaker, Badge 278, Sergeant Andrew Colborn, Badge 432, who assisted me in the search and collection of evidence. At 0800 hours, we began the search. Sergeant Colborn and I were taking photographs of evidence that was collected. I collected samples of suspected blood from the garage floor, emptied 22 casings from the garage floor, and the rear door of a Suzuki Samurai truck parked inside the garage for possible fingerprint evidence. We concluded the search at 0947 hours. At 0947 hours, I collected four burning barrels that were outside of the garage to the southeast of it, approximately 50 yards. These barrels were loaded onto a covered trailer and possession was turned over to Marie Osterhaus, badge 604 for transport to the Calumet County Sheriff's Department. The barrels were loaded and custody was transferred at 1011 hours. My team and I returned to the command post area. We were given the assignment to search the residence at 12930A Avery Road. I went to the residence to conduct the search assisted by Lieutenant Link, Detective Rimaker, and Sergeant Colburn. We conducted a search of the residence collecting a suspected blood spot in the hallway near the door on the east side of the residence. I photographed and collected the suspected blood sample. The search was conducted at 1221 hours. My search team and I were sent to 12932 Avery Road to specifically collect any weapons, a vacuum cleaner, and bedding from a spare bedroom in the trailer. I went to the trailer to collect the evidence assisted by Lieutenant Link, Sergeant Colburn and Detective Rimaker. At 12.25 hours, we entered the residence and I collected two guns that were in a gun rack that were in the back bedroom of the residence. The gun rack was on the wall above the bed in this bedroom. One weapon was a semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle. The other weapon was a 50 caliber black powder muzzle loader. On the muzzle loader was a piece of masking tape with the name of Steve handwritten on it. I collected the bedding and a vacuum from the middle bedroom. My team and I left the trailer at 12.48 hours. Page 102. At the command post, Lieutenant Bowie gave me the assignment of searching and collecting any evidence from a Ford F-350 parked at the garage at 12932 Avery Road. Detective Remaker, Sergeant Colburn, and I went to the vehicle and conducted the search. Between 1248 hours and 1549 hours, Lieutenant Link, Sergeant Colburn, Detective Remaker, and I searched the new shop building and then the residence at 12928 Avery Road. We located three handguns and two police badges in the new shop building and one 22 caliber rifle in the residence at 12928 Avery Road that were collected at a later time. At 1549 hours, we began the search. Sergeant Colburn and I photographed the vehicle. I found and collected hairs and fibers from both the passenger and driver's side doors in the vehicle. Also collected was a blanket, floor mat with reddish-brown stains on it, a rag, a paper with a computer dating type service printed on it. At 1610 hours, Detective Remaker and Sergeant Colburn received a different assignment and left the search of the truck. Detective Remaker of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, badge 832, assisted me in completing the search, collected 
was more hair and fibers from the passenger side of the vehicle. We ended the search at 1631 hours. The vehicle was a black Ford F-350 pickup truck with a truck plate of AG5467. End of supplemental report for incident number LCA05110300-9213. Detective Dan Kercharski, number 834, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 103, Type of Activity Supplemental Report. Date of Activity 110605, Reporting Officer, Deputy Craig Wendling. On 11.06.05, I, Deputy Craig Windling of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, was called by Investigator Mark Wiegert, who asked if I would be available to go over to Teresa Halbach's residence at West 3637 County Highway B to collect evidence. Investigator Wiegert wanted me to pick up evidence that would, would contain Teresa Halbach's DNA in case it would be needed for further identification. I informed Investigator Wieger I would go in route and collect some evidence. Investigator Wieger told me a toothbrush, lip chapstick, and possibly a vibrator that was located in her dresser would be good items to collect. I did arrive at the residence at approximately 0750 hours. I was led into the residence by a party who was Teresa Halbach's roommate, Scott A. Blodorn, date of birth 110279. I introduced myself to Scott Blodorn and told him Investigator Wieger wanted me to stop by to collect some items of Teresa's that would assist us, if needed, for identification purposes. Scott did bring me into the bathroom, which is located on the southeast side of the home on the first floor. Scott opened up the top drawers of the cabinet in the bathroom, which he stated contained all her belongings. In the left top drawer, just to the left of the sink, I did find Teresa's toothbrush, which I was told by Scott would be hers, and some chapstick. I did collect those items at 0759 hours. Those items were placed into a plastic bag and sealed. I then looked into the top drawer on the very right of the cabinet in the southeast bathroom on the first floor and was also located another lip moisturizer that had some hair stuck to it and a hairbrush, which also contained some hair. Those items were also collected at approximately 0759 hours and placed into a plastic bag and sealed. I then asked Scott if he could bring me to Teresa's bedroom, which I located on the first floor in the southwest corner of the res residence. Once inside the room, I did locate the center compartment cabinet doors on the dresser, and inside there was a cardboard box containing a reddish maroon case with a zipper. Once I opened up that case, I did locate a vibrator or a sexual device. I re-zipped the case, placed it into a plastic bag, and sealed it. That item was collected at approximately 0803 hours. I did take a quick scan around the room to see if there would be any other items useful for identification purposes for DNA, and was unable to see anything that would be as helpful as I already had. Page 104. At that time, I did in contact with Scott and went en route to the sheriff's department where all the items I collected were placed into evidence and secured in locker number five in the evidence room. Investigator Wiegert was notified of the items were obtained and placed into evidence. Deputy Craig Windling, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 105. Type of activity. Contact with George Zipperer. Date of activity 11.06.05. Reporting, uh, reporting Officer, Investigator John Dietering. Documents generated none. On Sunday, 11.06.05 at 08.21 hours, I, Dietering, assisted by Detective Jacobs, did make contact with George Zipperer, previously mentioned in this report at his residence, 4433 County Highway B, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Prior to asking Zipper any questions, 
I advised him he was free to go, was not under arrest, and could terminate the conversation at any time he so chose. He indicated he understood this. He stated he would agree to answer questions. I asked George Zipperer if he had ever done business with the Avery's Auto Salvage Operation. His response was, hell no, I don't even know them. I asked him if he had ever been at the Avery business, and he responded, no. I asked him if he was in any way related or close friends with the Averys, and his response was no. George Zipper indicated that on Monday, 10.31.05, he was at Bellaban Real Estate Offices near the intersection of 11th and Marshall in the city of Manitowoc. He stated that he was on the job site from 8 o'clock a.m. approximately until 5 o'clock p.m. He stated he never left the job site and has witness witnesses that can verify him. George indicated that a female photographer had called the residence previously and was told by George not to come onto the property. George did not recall when this conversation had taken place. I did take the following written statement from George Zipperer. On Monday, 10.31.05, I was on a job on Marshall Street between 10th and 11th in Manitowoc. I got there at 8 a.m. I didn't leave the site during the day. I left the job about 5 p.m. Mark Bellaban was there, along with at least one employee, Rick Strassner. There was also a painter there. The building is on the southwest corner, 11th and Marshall. I've never done business with the Avery family. I've never been to the Avery junkyard. I'm not friends with any of the Avery family. Page 106. I have dictated this statement to Investigator Dietering. I have read this statement and have initialed all the corrections. The statement is true and accurate. This statement was signed in my presence by George Zipperer at 10.45 hours on 11.06.05. My contact with George Zipper ended at 08.52 hours. Investigation continues. John Dietering, Investigator, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 107. Type of activity interview of Joe Ellen Zipperer. Date of activity 110605. Reporting officer, investigator John Dietering. Documents generated, none. On Sunday, 110605 at 0910 hours, I Dietering did interview Joe Ellen Zipperer, previously mentioned in this report, at her residence at 4433 County Highway B, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Joellen indicated that on Monday, 10.31.05, she had had no personal phone contact with the lady who apparently took pictures of the vehicle, but stated the caller did leave a message indicating that she could not find the residence. It should be noted that at 09.30 hours, Detective Jacobs did receive permission from the zippers to copy this message onto his cell phone, and apparently this was later placed onto a CD. Joe Ellen went on to indicate that she believed the photographer arrived at approximately 14.30 hours and indicated this was before Jason, her son, got home from school. She stated that she didn't see or hear the vehicle enter the driveway. Joe Ellen Zipper indicated that she gave the photographer directions as to how to get to the Firebird she needed to photograph. Joe Ellen indicated the photographer was dressed in blue jeans with a darker jacket waist length, some sort of a white top. She stated she had brownish hair, but Joe Ellen was not sure about the length. Joe Ellen indicated that the photographer returned several minutes later smiling, indicating that she stated she had found the car. <clears throat> Joe Ellen <clears throat> indicated that the photographer left a copy of the auto trader and some sort of contract on the on an outdoor table. Joellen did not move these items until she provided them to us on 11.03.05. Joellen indicated that the photographer had not collected any money, and Joellen indicated that the family was not sure if they wanted the, photog the photograph run or not. Joellen indicated that she was out at the back of the residence and did not see the vehicle leave either, so she could not determine which direction the vehicle took after leaving the residence. I did transcribe the following written statement obtained by Joellen Zipper. On Monday, 
10.31.05, between 2 and 2.30 p.m., I was out in the backyard. All at once a lady appeared. She was shorter and petite. She was wearing darker waist-length jacket. She had brown hair. She asked if she could take photos of a firebird that Jason, page 108, owns. She said she had talked to George and that it is was okay. I told her how to get to the car and she left. About five minutes later, she came back. She was walking fast. She told me she found it and was smiling. She laid some papers on the table and she left. I didn't see what car she was driving. I have dictated this statement to Investigator Dietering. I have read this statement and have initialed all corrections. This statement is true and accurate. This statement was signed in my presence by Joe Ellen Zipperer at 9.31 a.m. on 11.06.05. I did terminate my contact with Mrs. Zipper at 09.36 hours. John Dietering, Investigator, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 109. Type of Activity, Supplemental Report. Date of activity, 11.06.05. Reporting officer, Investigator Wendy Baldwin. On 11.06.05, I, Investigator Baldwin, along with Julie Creamer and her dog Brutus, from Great Lakes Search and Rescue, did search the pond area where Teresa's vehicle was found. At approximately 9.03 a.m., Brutus had made a hit on a silver station wagon type vehicle located on the southwest corner of the pond. I observed what appeared to be a bloody rag laying in the back seat of that vehicle. I did tag and mark that vehicle for evidence processing. The dog continued to work in the area and made another alert on a tan Honda four-door vehicle. I did observe what appeared to be blood spots in the front passenger and rear seats of that vehicle. I did contact Lieutenant Brett Bowie, who made arrangements for an officer to secure that scene until the evidence could be processed. Later that afternoon, I assisted with volunteer fire department personnel to open every hood and trunk of the vehicles located on the Avery property. Investigator Wendy Baldwin, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 110. Type of Activity Supplemental Report. Date of Activity 11.06.05. Reporting Officer Lieutenant Brett Bowie. On 11.06.05 at approximately 9.40 a.m., I, Lieutenant Brett Bowie of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, assisted DCI with examining two vehicles that were located on the southeast corner of the Avery's Auto Salvage Yard. These vehicles would have been on the northwest corner of a pond directly across from the location where the Hobock vehicle was located. These vehicles were alerted on by cadaver dogs and they appeared to be small red spots inside the vehicles. The vehicles were photographed by the DCA agent. One particular vehicle, that being a tan Toyota four-door, had a secured trunk area. The area was forced open and inside was a pair of women's panties as well as a pair of women's camouflaged insulated boots. These items were photographed and it was determined that they should be gathered as possible evidence due to the fact that it was raining quite hard and the rain was actually turning to snow. I retrieved both of these items and placed them into bags. The item of collection was indicated on the bags and the bags were turned over to Deputy Nicholas of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department to be transported back to the Sheriff's Department for any further use of them. Lieutenant Brett J. Bowie, Calumet County, Sheriff's Department. All right, so let's start our review. We are on page 101. It's the missing persons on Sunday 1106 with Garchinsky. And note that it is Stephen Avery's residence there because it's 12932. So 32 is Stephen's trailer. And here's the introduction of saying they state that they collect four burning barrels that were outside of the garage to the southeast approximately 50 yards. Now I wanted to look at a map and let's talk about is this really Stephen's backyard? All right you guys I went ahead and got us this little picture here and we are looking at the Dassey and the Avery residence. So the little red trailer here is Stephen's and this is the garage that they're focused on. So let's go ahead and put that together there. 
Now, if you look at the directional path, southeast would be this direction. And if we're carrying that out from the garage, it would point us in that direction. So let's grab a little box here and see what we have an interest at approximately those feet. Now also keep in mind, I'm just guessing a car length is about 10 to 12 feet. We're looking at 50 yards, there's three feet in a yard, so that's 150 feet, which would be about 15 car lengths from the garage in the southeast direction. So we'll leave this little box where that could be, and you can make out what appears to be something along the nature, it could be barrels, I'm not sure, but right in that area is where we're talking. So really, we're looking at the Dassey residence, but let's go back to Stevens residence. And here's where um, we're still on 101. And at the bottom, it talks about the two weapons, the semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle, as well as a 50 caliber black powder muzzle loader. And it's noted with a piece of masking tape on the muzzle loader that has the name Steven. Way to call it out, you know, this is Steven's gun. It's even got his name on it. When we know that these guns don't belong to Steven, they belong to the person he's renting the property from. Let's go on to page 102. Now they've moved on out to the Ford uh, F-350 of Stevens that's parked in the driveway. And then they take a break from that and they go over to, and this is Link Colburn and Remaker. They go into the new shop building. And you know that address by the 12928. So if it's 28, we're referring to the shop. And they locate three handguns and, very importantly, two police badges and one 22 caliber rifle. And what are we looking for in this case? A 22 caliber rifle. What are two police badges doing there? Well, this is a great question. Now, I know that Arlen Avery, which was their uncle, had been a police officer, and it's my understanding that he um, worked for Manitowoc County as well as the Green Bay uh, Department as well. So that could be the two police badges. And yes, my talk, Maya, is snoring in background. Please forgive me. She's a pug, and she has breathing problems, but she sleeps every time I do a video. So forgive me for that. Um, and then we drop down here, and you note they have to stop searching the vehicle, and they have to leave. And they state that Detective Remaker and Sergeant Colburn receive a different assignment and left the search of the truck. What different assignment is this? This is that they are responding to Marable Caves. So they're going to go to Marable Caves. They're going to find a, um, a report later on in this section that we're reading this week about what happens there. So I wanted to make note that that's what they're doing. And then as we scroll on to 103, we find that this Craig Winderling, or Windling, he's told to collect a toothbrush, chapstick, and possibly a vibrator that was located in her desk drawer. And this is of Teresa Halbox. How did they know the vibrator was located in the dresser drawer? Who's the individual that actually gives them this information, do you suspect? I doubt a parent would know that. I doubt a roommate would know that, unless, of course, there's some sexual interaction, which we do find out later is true. But who would for sure know this would be Ryan Hillegas, because he's the one that shows them around to where her laundry is and all her personal items in her room. Now, Scott goes, takes these investigators into the bathroom, and he, he opens the top drawers of the cabinet in the bathroom, which he states contains all her belongings. Are you trying to tell me this girl's entire makeup kit and everything fit in the top little drawers of the cabinet? I don't know about you guys, but I find that hard to believe. But uh, looking in the top drawer, right cabinet, southeast bathroom, first floor, they collect moisturizer, which has some hair stuck to it, a hairbrush that had hair. Um, once inside the bedroom, he does find this um, cardboard box containing this reddish maroon case with a zipper. Once I opened the case, I did locate a vibrator or sexual device. So the thing about DNA like that is it could have mixed DNA from multiple people. And um, I find it interesting that they would even consider a vibrator being that it would be mixed DNA. 
and then we're going to skip 104, not much there. 105, we're going to jump down to George Zipper, and this is Monday. And it's basically giving him an alibi. So for all those George Zipper fans that really have him as a suspect, it does state that he is verified on the job from 8 a.m. till until 5 p.m. in Manitowoc, and it looks like he's at the uh, 11th Street or 11th and Marshall in Manitowoc. He did indicate the female f photographer um, had called the residence, but he had told her not to come to the property. All right, you guys, I've jumped ahead to 107. And again, it's the 6th, and it's interview with Joe Ellen Zipper. And I made a couple notes on her, on her recollection. Um, now, keep in mind, this is a report of what she said, so it's written by the reporting, Officer Deary. The state, the, uh, but stated the caller did leave a message, which would be Teresa, indicating she could not find the residence. So she couldn't find the residence. And it should be noted at 9.30 hours, Jacobs did receive permission from the zippers to copy this message onto his cell phone and apparently had, um, was later placed on a CD. And Zelna reports that this call is missing. The CD is missing. So before we go any further, I wanted to play a call that sounds very much like this, that supposedly is coming from the Yonda residence. To you, I'm calling on behalf of Kawasaki APD. Hello, this is Teresa with Auto Trader Magazine. I'm the photographer, and I'm just giving a call to let you know that I could come out there today um, in the afternoon. It would probably be around 2 o'clock or even a little later. Um, if you could please give me a call back and let me know if that'll work for you because I don't have your address or anything, so I can't stop by without getting a call back from you. And my cell phone is 737-4731. Again, it's Teresa, 920-737-4731. Thank you. Monday, 12.25 a.m. All right, you guys, so that was the call. Doesn't it make you wonder if that's actually the zipper call that we're missing and they've literally relabeled the evidence to say Joe Ellen? It just makes you wonder. All right, let's go ahead and continue down on the same page. Joe Ellen indicated that the photographer left, left a copy of the auto trader and some other um, sort of stuff on the table there. Contact and in, contract info. She didn't move it for four days outside and it was still sitting there because it says Joellen did not move these items until she provided them to us. That's just strange to me. Joellen indicated she was out back of the residence, did not see the vehicle leave either, so she didn't see Teresa's vehicle come or go, so we have no idea there. She couldn't even help with the direction. And on page 108, I note that she stated, meaning Joellen, this is her statement that she had talked to George and that it was okay so George is stating before he said no to the to the lady Teresa but then Joellen states that George said it was okay page 109 we're now jumping ahead we're with Wendy Baldwin and we're talking about Brutus and I think this is very worthy at approximately 9.03 a.m. 11-6 with Wendy Baldwin. Brutus had made a hit on a silver station wagon type vehicle located on the southwest corner of the pond. And then I observed what appeared to be a bloody rag laying in the backseat of the vehicle. Bloody rag. And Wendy Baldwin finds it. Interesting. And then she observes what appeared to be blood spots in front, passenger, and rear seats of that vehicle. Why is this not tested? Why didn't we not find out about this blood? And what about this bloody rag? Was that tested? Whose DNA was on that rag? And then later she assists the volunteer fire department personnel to open every hood and trunk of the vehicle located on the Avery property. At what point did she turn this into evidence? The other question I have would be, 
the fact that why aren't they using the dogs to tell which vehicles to open? Obviously, the dogs would alert if the person's in the vehicle, if they've given the dogs the scent. They're relying on the dogs to tell them so much. So why did they do it that way where they opened every vehicle and didn't utilize the dogs? All right, I'm on page 110. And one particular vehicle, that being a tan Toyota dog. Now, the cadaver dogs are alerting. Remember, they only respond to human remains or blood. And they're alerting on a tan Toyota four-door. They had a secure trunk. When they pop the trunk open, there are a pair of women's panties as well as camouflage insulated boots. So what DNA was on these panties? Did it match Teresa Halbach? Why don't we hear about a report in the crime lab on these women's panties? So that kind of does our wrap up for this uh, today's Daily Ma'am. I hope that you enjoyed the read. All right, you guys, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. The support everybody gives us is great, and um, it's amazing. You guys always stand up for Stephen and Brendan, and with them being wrongfully convicted, they should have never spent one day in prison. Not one day. All right, you guys, it's time. If you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time. Thank you guys and have a great night.